I am so honored to be able to introduce our speaker today. I met this young man uh, many years ago when he used to come down to uh, Ferry Field, had young ladies running track and field. Uh, he's a retired policeman from the Detroit uh, Police Department, and uh, Don Cannon was the athletic director, and Don Cannon saw what Red was doing, and so he hired him as the first track and field coach for women at the University of Michigan. He has so many great athletes that love him dearly. When they have reunions, it's just a pleasure to see the, the gals who are all very successful in their lives in various fields of endeavor. And if I started to tell you about what Reb Simmons did as a young man in Detroit High School at Ypsilanti Normal College as a student athlete there, as a police officer, uh, he's put a number of things out on the desk here when you ought to come by later on and see some of the things he's done. He was a boxing champion, an all-around track athlete, ran against Jesse Owens, who some of you don't remember, but he was pretty good. <laughs> and Red was very good. And he brought along his bride, Lois. If anybody here is a Michigan basketball fan or volleyball fan or football fan, Lois and Red are there. And Red is still commenting about they should do this on the basketball court. They aren't passing right on the basketball court. And he's absolutely right. The guy is phenomenal. He gets up in the morning. He goes over to Chrysler Arena. He walks and jogs around the concourse. He goes into the weight room, works out on the weight room, comes over to Paula's on Packard and has a cup of coffee with his friends. He's off to a luncheon to give a speech. He's down here. He's over there. And that's how you get to be 97 years old. I'd like to re introduce Kenneth Red Simmons, our speaker today. Thanks, Don, for the... Can you all hear me all right? At my age, I have to have notes, you know. I'm uh, really uh, happy to be here. And I want to greet all you Kiwanians and your guests. And, of course, at my age, uh, I'm happy to be anywhere. Uh, uh, of course, uh, old age has... Some disadvantages, you know. You you got bifocals, and I've got uh, a hearing aid. Uh, you know, there's other problems. Your your knees buckle, but your belt won't. Uh, you got a you got a lot of room in your house, but uh, there's not enough room in the medicine chest for you what you want to put there. So there's a lot of problems with being aged, but there's some advantages. And uh, one of them is that everybody calls you sir. And the other one is there's nobody left to refute anything you say. <laughs> so I brought along here a few things. Some I will pass out, but I expect to get them back. Uh, the rest of them you can come up and look at, but I have to have some things to back up what I'm going to say because few people believe it. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is something that people uh, ask me with a little uh, doubt in their mind. Uh, how did you, at 50 years of age, a retired cop who never taught never coached, come to the University of Michigan and become a professor and a head coach. Well, there's a story goes with that, as Damon Runyon says. Uh, I have to start and go back probably, uh, well, I'll say 1918. My father, uh, at that time I was eight years old. So... Uh, 
My father took me down to uh, City Hall to watch the uh, First World War Victory Parade. And uh, he was a, a man that uh, few people didn't understand, but he actually took me to the Miles Theater in Detroit where I watched or listened to Madame Schumann hike. It didn't mean anything to me. Uh, Enrico Caruso, he even took me to... Uh, uh, Toledo for the Dempsey Furpo fight. I know some of you probably don't even know what that means, but <laughs> but uh, at that time we moved out to Grand River and uh, Seven Mile Road, which was all farm country. And I went to a little school, and it was a country school, eight grades in one room. Lamps on the wall, big furnace up in front, two outhouses in back. And the woman uh, that taught there, say one year, she couldn't date. She had to live with a farmer's house. And uh, that was a pretty tough time for those teachers. But when I was in the seventh grade, something happened that changed my life. And I probably wouldn't even be here. I have a picture here. This one right here, Don. Uh, Lois, you can show these too. This is the Beach Road School. Eight grades in there. You notice from that picture that there are many of those children look to be 15, 16 years old. They're not out of the eighth grade yet. The only reason they came to school was there was nothing doing on the farm. And in that picture, there's only three or four that got to high school. But in the seventh grade, in that picture, you'll see the guy in the middle there sitting down with a hole in his stocking here. That's me. Uh, we had a man come to the school. His name was Mr. Pontius. He was from the Carlisle Indian School. Have any ever heard of that? That's where Jim Thorpe went to school. Mr. Pontius was different. He had the farmers come and mow a place for us to run. And he made a long jump pit and a high jump pit. And he put the little sticks up where we could hurdle. He even had a baseball field made later. Kenneth, that's my name, Kenneth. A lot of people don't know it. They think it's red. In fact, I actually get letters with R-E-D-D, -D, Red Simmons. I think that's my name. Anyway, he told my folks that Kenneth should go to high school. He's going to be a great athlete someday. And I did go to high school. My folks were very, very poor. I walked from, I went to, we moved to Grand River and Seven Mile Road, all farm country. And I went to this little country school. And I walked. From a ran, I should say, from seven mile to six mile when I started high school. Sometimes ride the inner urban, but as soon as I got to high school as a, as a freshman, I could beat the varsity. It was nothing I trained for, it was just something I inherited. And uh, right away I was a star. I could beat anybody in the hurdles or sprints or jumps or anything, and it was I was just a little guy. And in 1926, we went into the city. I was captain of the football team. The coach said, we're going in the big time now. What do you want to be called? We're not going to play Plymouth and Northville. We're going to play the city, Detroit, Central, Northwestern. I weighed 145 pounds, and I said, uh, let's be the Huskies. <laughs> And today, they are still called Redford High School. It's called the Redford Husky. They're called Huskies. As a matter of fact, our, co our uh, basketball coach, Tommy Amaker, recruiting the Harris boys, told him, do you know that we have a professor and a coach, head coach at Michigan, that named you a Husky? And the first thing those Harris boys did that came, that came to see me, that I had named them a Husky. Well, anyway, I uh, became uh, a prospect for the University of Michigan. I think the coach at that time was named Farrell. And this was 1928. 
Matter of fact, I think in my pocket here, I have my lucky piece. Interscholastic medal, 1928, for the hurdles. I shouldn't have this. The reason I had to say it's my lucky piece is I should have been second. Man in front of me tripped and stuck my chest out, and I was first. <laughs> I always kept this. Everything's been great for me ever since. This, I, I, I've had this in my pocket, this lucky piece. But anyway, Coach Farrell said he'd like to have me come to University of Michigan. He didn't have scholarships. In. You notice I put aside my notes. And I, I, I can't remember what I had in them anyway. So uh, Coach Farrell said, I told him, I said, uh, they didn't have scholarships. You had a job then. And he said, uh, we'd like to have you come here. You're a great athlete, good hurdler. There's things you can do here. So I told him, I said, I, I can't, uh, I haven't got the tuition and I can't afford the books. He, I just said, could I work a little while? And then come back. Oh, he said, a man like you, you'll only get better. You get in the AAU meets and compete, and when you're ready, come back. So I was ready to go back in 1929, and some of you may remember the great stock crash in the Depression. And Coach Farrell uh, wrote to my parents and said, Kenneth doesn't have a job. The kids he was going to wait on, their old man went broke in the stock market. And they got his job, so I didn't have a job. And I wasn't going to go to college. But Lloyd Owens over at Michigan Normal College, he also knew that I had set records and won the two hurdles in the state beat. So he said, you should come to Michigan Normal College. That's now called Eastern Michigan University. 1,100 kids there, 800 and some are women, only a couple hundred men. It was a teacher's college. So tuition is only $18.50, so I thought, well, I'll go there. I said, I haven't got the tuition, but I can. So we can't give you a job. But I went anyway, but I hitchhiked from Grand River and Telegraph Road to Ipsy every day, carried my lunch, and hitchhiked home every night. Oh, about a couple of months, Charles McKinney, who was the president then, called my folks and said, I don't think Kenneth's going to make it. His grades aren't very good. I couldn't afford the books either. So about the same time, they had the interclass track beat, and I beat all the varsity. So Lloyd Olds and uh, Bingo Brown, who was beating them in, and state boxing commissioner, and... Uh, They'd had the interclass track meet. I beat all the varsity, so they looked like they, I should be cleaning mats. And uh, I had a cleaning crew. I got pieces of clothing and shoes, a hat once in a while. It was discarded. Glenardine Snow was the nurse, school nurse in Star the Kitchen in Starkweather Hall. So then, from then on, I lived like their hall. Betty would have our dinner ready. We took the same subjects, the same food with all this help. And uh, I'd get her home at 10 o'clock. And uh, I lived like a king. And we were, we had a great team. I have here a picture of the, uh, of course, it's written on there, Champions of America. Anybody can say that and they can't deny it. But I have on my wrist, 1932, it's still running. Running better than its owner. Uh, like it's engraved, Championship of America. So I had a very good time, and I lived like a king for a long time until 1933, and I'm out on the street. No jobs, nothing. But the houses were a lot of empty houses in Italy at that time. And you could go in the back door. Another guy and I went in the back door. They had a stove there, a wood stove, pick up branches, tree, wood, anything. Worked in restaurants, stuffed their pockets with all the food we could swipe out of the place. And that's the way we lived. And I lived that way from June of 33 until May the 1st of 34. Detroit Police Department, the city of Detroit had gone broke. They decided to start a field day. They wanted athletes. Get that redhead. He's hot stuff. 
Here's a picture. This is the state fairgrounds. You can see thousands of people in the stands. I saved that particular picture because it shows Red Simmons winning a 100-yard dash there. But that is uh, uh, odd to mention that they paid us 12, 10, 8, and 6 for the first four places. I was making $80, $90 a meet running five, six, seven, eight events, anything I could get in. And uh, our pay then was $1,950 a year, so I was really helping the family here.